Last week, I promised that today we'd start on the devotional life in Lutheranism, but I <laughs> forgot that I had actually planned something in between there. And now, <laughs> um, so kind of in the theme of me saying, like way back when I was trying to introduce this particular thing, that it's easily forgotten within Christianity as, or at least popular Christianity. Well, I forgot it. Oh, yeah. what do you know? Uh, so right now we're going to focus on a specific vocation that people have, which is going to be to the environment. So environmental ethics can actually be found in scripture. It's just not the main focus of scripture because the main focus of scripture is our salvation in Jesus Christ. So that's from cover to cover in scripture and that's what's focused on. But uh, also in scripture, we find all different vocations we have to different people. And we will also find that we have vocations to things that aren't people, such as animals and the environment at large. Uh, for this one, though, um, I've, I've been trying to see the Lutheran viewpoint versus say some of the viewpoints from other denominations. For this one, in all honesty, I can't do that because I have not been able to find comprehensive sources to actually deal with environmental ethics within any Christian denomination. I, I know that they're there somewhere, but I just not have, I have not been able to find them. Uh, even within Lutheranism, there's some study that has been done into this. Uh, I did a little bit of study myself, so this is going to be following a little bit, a paper that I wrote during seminary. But when I was researching that paper, seeing like what, what duty do we have to the environment, to God's creation, finding sources was hard. Like there's a, there's a lot of environmental resources from a Christian perspective, don't get me wrong, but Usually what happens in these sources, and I checked like a dozen books and, uh, and collections of articles, and usually in every single one of these books and articles, at least the ones that I was having to look into, usually what the default position was, was they say Christians should look at the environment and then it's a biblical position, but they never actually support it as a biblical position. They immediately go to, and this is how the secular community d looks at environmental ethics. And then they say that that's biblical, but it's not biblical. <laughs> so uh, in a lot of the books and articles I was looking in, they were trying to promote a secular view of environmental ethics, but say that it was actually Christian. And just because that was in all the resources I look at, I'm going to say that that's probably the default position of Christians when they're viewing environmental ethics is that it, it's just uh, secular ethics dressed up as in a Christian veneer. Um, I know, and then again, I know that there are denominations who have looked into this and tried to find try to, 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 to create a system of ethics for the environment, but uh, again, these are hard, hard, difficult to find. So I know it exists in the Roman Catholic Church somewhere. I, I've heard some Catholics reference it, but I haven't found the sources. Um, in the Missouri Synod, they also made a, well, not a booklet, it's a bit longer than that. They made some sort of study into ethics towards nature but it's not written nearly at a popular level. I was looking at that the other day. Uh, it is, it, it's not easily digestible for a Bible study. So <clears throat> what we're gonna do is we're going to go through environmental ethics in general, just basically looking at a few scripture passages and build it up from there. And that will be everything that I'll cover on environmental ethics. Uh, uh, duties to creation in general, because I just can't find the, the sources to give you something more comprehensive. Sorry. So, 
I will now share my screen so we can so we all have something handy dandy to look at. So where do we go for creational ethics? Well, the creation, oddly enough. And since we're familiar with the creation event, I'm going to read through this relatively quickly as I'm hoping that everybody knows this more or less. And then I'll just bring out a few questions for, for discussion about what we find here specifically and um, hopefully we can get an idea of uh, what humans were created to do for in, in creation. So from Genesis 1, beginning of the first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was the, over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, and each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their, their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. I'm going to stop there for now. So we have Genesis 1, verses 1 to 25. So there, there's a word that God keeps using to describe his creation. What is it? It was good. It was good. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> and what does good mean here? That's probably going to be very important as we come into this. What, what does good mean here? Balance. Okay. And what else? Perfect. 
Oh, yeah, thing. perfect. And, and there's something else in the German, kind of, and it comes through in English fairly well, um, kind of in, the, in our translation here. Kind of in the spirit of these things you already named. What happens if you take an O away from good? God. God. Yeah. Like God is good. Mm hmm. So, this, yeah, this comes up very well in German and also English, which is descended from German, at least part of it is. That goodness, as, as it appears in scripture, derives from God. So if we're saying that all things work together, kind of as, as Deborah was saying, that everything's balanced and that it's perfect, then everything kind of has, is an example of God. So the perfection, the design, the intelligence behind everything, creation reflects the goodness of its creator. So we've had about um, almost six and a half days of creation. I'm oh, sorry, five and a half days of creation. Everything's good. Has man shown up yet? Not quite. Not quite. We were created good. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know how long they stayed good. Yeah. So everything was created good before man was created good. Does that mean creation is good apart from humanity? So does, does creation need to need human beings to be good? No, absolutely. I heard an absolutely in there. Yeah, that was Laura. <laughs> No. Can you explain? <laughs> well, well, I was thinking about a, a scripture verse where it was saying that the creation is groaning for the redemption. In other words, it's not their fault that they are suffering under the curse that man is under. So that the creation needs um, it, it, when a ben what benefits when man acts godly. Okay. That's what I meant. So, okay, so it the creation needs God in it. So, yeah, and people to very, act godly, right? Yeah. So in a way, human beings can actually be bad for the environment if they are not being good. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, kind of in that sense, we can actually say that creation does is not dependent on human beings to be itself good. It, it's, it's good from the beginning. Well, I don't know quite about that because after hmm. the fall, um, then the creation and the creatures um, we're suffering mm -hmm. after the but, fall. But we're, we're talking about Genesis okay, chapter sorry. one, which is before the fall, though. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. So, so will you restate what you said now that I understand? Okay. So creation is good in and of itself, and all the aspects of creation are good in and of themselves, independent of human beings. Oh, up until the... the well, <laughs> well, creation is reflecting the goodness of its creator. Right. So all these things are good. Because uh, let, let's point to kind of a few random days here. So let's say um, uh, day two here, where God separates water from water and he lets waters, uh, uh, sorry, that, that's day two and three, but separates water from water and there's an expanse in, up above and that expanse is called heaven or the sky. 
is called good by God. Therefore, the sky is good. And human beings weren't even mentioned in, in this verse to call it good. So it's not that sky is, the sky is good because of human beings, but the sky is good because it reflects the perfection and the design of its creator, God. Okay. And then we can even go skip down to say, uh, uh, third day, God causes dry land to appear, uh, plants yielding uh, seeds and their fruit. Uh, they appear. God calls all of this good, the plants good, the dry land good, and human beings have yet to appear. But because God designed these things and they're reflecting the goodness of their creator, they're good, independent of human beings. So as we, as we look into creation, we're seeing that these things are created by God, reflecting God's goodness, and they are, by definition, good. So it's not that all creation needs human beings to make itself good. What creation needs to make itself good is God. Which is also a little bit what you were saying, Laura, when you were saying that... Um, uh, when creation groans, it needs man to act godly. Not, not necessarily that man has to be there to make creation good, but that man has to be godly, reflect the goodness of his creator in order to give that goodness into the creation. Something like that. Something like that. So we find actually that creation was good even before the creation of man. And by man, I mean male and female. Yeah. 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 So creation, as long as it's reflecting God's goodness, is itself good. And we can get into how the creation also falls, but we'll, we'll see how far we get this morning. You may get a, you may talk a lot about a, a few different things. So now let's look at introduction of humankind. So this is still on the sixth day. This is after the creation of all the animals. So human beings are the last thing that God actually creates. Everything else can't, comes before. Everything else before man is called good. So let's see what happens after man gets created. So uh, starting at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food and it was so. And God saw everything he had made and behold, it was very good. There is evening and there is morning the sixth day. So therefore, um, everybody was a vegetarian. Yes. Uh, including all the animals. Yep. And when did that end? Um, the definitive word 
comes after the flood of Noah. Oh. Before, before then, it's possible that some people were eating animals because um, um, Abel was a shepherd. So it's possible they were eating animals at that point that they weren't supposed to. Don't, we don't really know. Um, and, and we also don't really know when the animals started eating other animals. But after the flood in Genesis chapter 9, and we might actually touch on that because that's also an important passage kind of looking into our relationship with nature. But after the flood, then God allows human beings to start eating animals for food. So you have a, mm, according to the Genesis genealogies, oh shoot, I think it's about, uh, not, not 2,000 years, but close to it. But uh, yeah, from the creation until that time, about 2,000 years where God did not give the animals for food. I was just thinking, I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but um, before the flood, people lived, you know, many, many years, like Methuselah, almost 1,000 years, and even Adam, 900 and some. You think it was because they were vegetarians? <laughs> I would say probably not, because when you look at uh, Adam's genealogy in Genesis chapter 5, you can see that the lifespans get shorter and shorter, mm -hmm. even up until the time of Moses, uh, sorry, uh, time of Noah. Uh, Methuselah is the outlier there. Methuselah was Noah's, oh shoot, I forget. Methuselah was Noah's father, I believe, unless I'm completely out to lunch here. Uh, da, 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 da. Ah, grandfather, I was wrong. Okay, so Methuselah was Noah's grandfather, and Methuselah had a, was the longest lived human being. He lived longer than Adam. But all the other, all the other people, you see a progressive progression in uh, um, reduced age before death. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's because of. of it's just their uh, diet? I wouldn't necessarily say it's diet. Well, it might have been a either. factor, but not the whole thing. No. And do we but, know uh, that Methuselah never ate a piece of meat? We don't have a recording of it. No, right. So we're making assumptions about him. Well, we know that definitively that God said, eat plants, Genesis chapter one. And then you can eat the eat meat at, in Genesis chapter nine. Right. In between, we don't have anything talking about this. So if people were eating meat, then they were doing so outside of the will of God. Well, how about uh, but, uh, this? This is kind of distracting from what we're concerned with here, uh, unfortunately. Okay. So looking at man's creation, and by man I mean man and man and woman. I, I'm just going to change this. Humanity's creation. There we go. Just to be clear, in humanity's creation, how is this different from all the other creation events that have gone on before in the previous five and a half days? He's created in God's image. Yep. And God blessed them. Mm hmm. Is he a specific blessing? Sorry, what's that? He gave dominion over creation to dominion. Know. There we go. So the image of God is going to be a very important thing. Dominion is going to be a very important thing. And the blessing, well, the blessing is kind of also the dominion. Uh, but um, we can even compare what does, how does God bless them? As we have a few different parts in here. So let's look at uh, Genesis 1, verse 28. So let's look at the first part here. So be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. How is, is this different from what's gone on before in, in the creation uh, in Genesis chapter 1? 
there were no jobs given to anybody, any of the creatures or there was nothing to do. They were just created. And what do they subdue? Subdue. Is that what we normally think of the word subdue or? I'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, kind of in the spirit of what does God give to the others to do? We actually find something interesting in verse 22 here. We have God blessed them. So this is uh, the birds of the air, the creatures of the sea. And Encourage. keep in mind, this is not supposed to be a, an official taxonomy in the modern sense. So if you're in the ocean, you are categorically a fish. If you're in the air, you're categorically, categorically a bird. So according to this taxonomy in ancient Hebrew, uh, bird, uh, sorry, bats would count as birds and whales would count as fish. <laughs> but he did expect them to multiply. Yes. So God's, you know, God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So he's saying, do this. Uh, he doesn't quite give, he doesn't articulate the blessing uh, to the land animals, but he does say, uh, I saw creeping things and the beasts according to their kinds and it was so, so we kind of, you kind of assume that you're also told to be fruitful and multiply, but that doesn't appear in the text. So the be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth, this part is not exactly unique to human beings. Like it is something we're called to do, don't get me wrong, but it's also something that you would expect to find in a lot of the animals. And the unique part here is the subdue. But there's also an order to this. He created the male and female. Mm -hmm. And blessed that union as a, as a, a multiplying factor. Mm -hmm. So it's not um, males having, two males having children. Yeah, I'm, 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 go, I'm gonna say that's pretty much impossible. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think it's important to note the order here as well. Mm. He created male and female. He didn't create two male birds and expected them to multiply. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you, you, we can say that God created creatures to live in community, that he created Man. these things with the ability to be fruitful and multiply. So you have families, but these are established upon the family as the basic unit of community. You have husband, wife to produce children. Pastor, I've just thought about this now, and I don't know if this even makes sense, but when the, he originally made the creation, you, you think that he just made two of each kind or, or several? We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Explicitly, we know that he created one male, one female for human beings, but the other, the other creatures, we don't really know. Um, you can also contrast this with angels. How many angels are there? We don't know, but they were created at the beginning and they were quite numerous. However, they were also created not to be given in marriage, that is not to have children. So whether that is a fair analogy is probably not a fair analogy because to be fruitful and multiply that, that implies that we, are, we were created to fill the earth, whereas the, the angels created at the beginning to fill the heavens with the same number creation will always have. So pastor, this is a hard question. You probably can't answer it, but before, God, before God created the world, uh, or the angels? Was he just the three of them by themselves? Well, God was by himself. That's the definition of 
the self-subsistent being is that he is who he is. He always is. Um, if we say before creation, that's also a bit of a tricky thing. Yeah. Because when... It, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just go right up to it. So, in the beginning, God created, which means the beginning was when God created. When did time start? At the creation. Before the creation, there was not time, or at least anything we would experience as time. So God always was, but we don't, we can't really say was in terms of time. But again, that's kind of beside the point. Right, I know. So what does, so we're looking at subdue. So this is unique to humanity. And God even claim, kind of explains this a little bit more when he says, uh, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So does, is there anything outside of this that man does not have dominion over? Yeah. God? Oh, oh, okay, I wasn't expecting that. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking in plurals here. God created Adam and Eve, presumably as fully grown adults. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't he have, you're talking in plural birds and animals, uh, you would think that God created creation as fully mature. Depends what you mean with fully mature there. Able to reproduce. Oh, with the ability to reproduce. Um, quite possibly, yes. Plural. Yeah, so he, it's unlikely that he created, or at least from how we are reading the text anyways, it's unlikely that God created eggs to hatch into birds, and that's how things got started. It's, it's more likely that he just said, let there be birds, and there were birds. Okay. Already in their adult form. I'm confused by the subdue it phrase. <laughs> there was there was no conflict. So what, what at that point in time, there was no conflict anywhere. Mm. So what are yeah. you doing? <laughs> yeah. And this is going to be a very interesting question to have. And when I was looking into when I was researching these things. So what does subdue it mean? Well, we have to look at it within its particular context, because that's also how you do language. You, you, uh, you determine what words mean based on their context. Uh, hopefully, words already have a base meaning that you can insert into the context, but you have to interpret words based on their context. So what does subdue it mean when there's no such thing as conflict? Because this is before the fall. There's no evil in the world. There is no cause to do violence. So what does subdue it mean? And you kind of have to go fairly abstract because we have to uh, imagine subduing creation before there was anything to uh, bring into line as it were. Uh, everything's acting according to the will of God, everything's uh, organized, designed by God to fulfill specific purposes. So what does subdue it mean? Um, it mean even like having... being a gardener, Pastor? Like if, like, they're, was that what Adam and Eve had to do? They had to be like gardeners? But that would even... Nothing is part of it. But weeds weren't a problem until after the fall. So what were you, you know, the garden functioned the way it was supposed to. Well, that also depends <laughs> on your definition of weed because weed typically means something that is an aberration, something that you don't want in the place that you designed for something else. 
That's right. And so that wouldn't have been a problem before the fall. No. It was designed the way it was and functioned the way it was supposed to. Yeah. So you would you would have all the what we would call weeds exist, but they were not known as weeds that because they were not seen as they weren't bad. troublesome. Yeah. 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 So when we're looking at subdue it and have dominion. And even uh, when we're going towards, say, behold, I have given you every green, every plant yielding seed. All of that should be interpreted kind of going back to who, who humankind is. So what makes them different from the rest of creation? The Creating image God. God's image. And, and subdue, I think, means to be godlike to them, like yeah. to keep things in balance. Yeah to keep the good it, it 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 as being good yeah so if if mankind is created in god's image what has god done so far in creation and we only have a most of a chapter before this point so what has god done in the chapter before this point you mean before he created man he said it order. Oh, there's order, and there's also fruit. Mm, not quite what I was looking for. Um, what? what is it? hmm. It's a hierarchy. I, I'm trying not to make it extremely obvious, but <laughs> it's it's. I think it's so obvious that people would, that you're just not thinking of it. Um, what did God do in the beginning? Created. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so uh, God created, and that's the fundamental thing, and he created it according to a design. Mm -hmm. So when human beings are created in God's own image, what are they created to do? To worship and praise God. Well, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Good. But how? But worship and praise God in doing what? Looking after the creation. Yes. That God made. So, so that's part of the design thing, where we're looking after creation, we're designing it, we're we're shaping the form. But there's also the. The maintenance of <coughs> creation, I guess. Creation, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So, so far, God has created and designed everything. So when God creates human beings in his own image, he created them to be creators and designers. So the designing is kind of the shaping of what what has gone on uh, before in creation. So this is kind of the, the subduing it thing, where you subdue creation by designing it. You, you shape things according to uh, how we would like them at that time. So this would be like tending the garden. It could also be something like shepherding the animals, moving them along, and have, enjoying their company. But there's also the creation aspect, or what we would probably better call the pro-creation aspect of things. So as God created every all life in there, human beings are the pro-creators, where we're bringing in uh, life into the creation through the means that God has given us, namely sexual activity, living as husband and wife. As God said, male and female, God created them to be fruitful and multiply. So God is ultimately the one who creates everything. He also created creatures within his creation to further create, to further live out what God is doing. So the creation reflects the goodness of its creator by creating, being fruitful and multiplying. But man created, uh, sorry, humanity created in the image of God has been called to the specific purpose of shaping and designing uh, this procreation within the universe so that things operate 
as God wants them to. So that's ultimately man's purpose within the creation and the fundamental aspect of all environmental ethics is that we are created to operate uh, or to, to work as God would have us work within creation by shaping it, forming it, and creating And, and this is uh, shaping and forming it, creating according to God's own will, according to the means by which he has given us. And I have to say that because there are, there are technologies developed already and are continuing to be uh, 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 researched where we're trying to go against creation and design against it, which is not good. But, um, so you have God in creation, above creation, looking over the whole creation, and then within the creation, you have human beings who are created, but also created in the image of God to act as those in dominion, that is, those in authority over the earth. So they're part of creation, but they're also lords of creation, and they're, uh, and they're living in this creation and ordering it. So there is also a difference in the conclusion of this day. God saw everything that he had made. So this is all things. So before he was looking at, uh, God saw that it, so God saw that uh, the creation of the beasts of the earth or God saw it, God saw the uh, uh, creation of, a dry land, for example. So those individual things are good, but when God saw everything together and acting together that he had made, behold, it was very good. So the best creation can ever be is when there is not only a God ruling in heaven who has created all things and designed them according to his will, but when God has instituted uh, his own image into that creation to rule it from a very personal perspective from within. And we see this lived out perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ, but uh, that is the second Adam, but for now we're looking at the first Adam and we can also kind of look at how we screwed it up, but um, yeah, this is this is what's going on. So uh, we'll also briefly look at Genesis chapter two to try and describe, uh, try to look at something that wasn't good in creation. <clears throat> So after the creation of Adam, so this is in Genesis chapter 2. Um, well, let's start at verse 18 there. So then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him, I will make him a helper fit for him. So what's not good? He's alone. Alone. And what's also not more specifically, what it what does it mean for this man to be alone? It's not good. So I can't multiply. Yes. And to multiply you need a partner, a female. A partner. There we go. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So here in scripture, in black and white, God says, it is not good that there is no woman. So in order for this to be good, you need a woman. And that's just the nature of the thing is that. But in the previous, didn't it say he created man, male and female? Yeah. So this is on the sixth day, chapter two. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of... A, 
expanding. Very specific collapse time event. So if we're looking at Genesis chapter one, which I'll do briefly go over here. So this is Genesis chapter one, verse 27. God created man in his own image. So in the image of God, he created him. So that's the third person uh, singular for, for uh, males. So this would be the first half of Genesis chapter two. And then it says here, male and female, he created them. So that's the second half of Genesis chapter two there. So Genesis chapter two is basically the uh, uh, explanation of Genesis chapter one, verse 27. So, oh, and I'll also make the point here. So if God said that it is not good, there's something that's not good, then he couldn't say that it was very good. So in order for creation to be very good on the sixth day, he had to create women first. So, Pastor, are you saying that after, let's go back to that, what you were highlighting. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Okay, and God saw that everything he made, he must have included Eve. Yes. Yeah, she had to. That's the point you're making. Yep. Then it was very good. Yep. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we're specifically looking at Eve's creation. Mm -hmm. or the woman who would become Eve. She, she doesn't get named Eve until after the fall, but um, she's the mother of all the living. That's what Eve it meant, uh, means. So uh, she's actually named Eve. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, this is kind of a tangent, but so the man called and his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. Why is she recognized as the mother of all the living? Well, if you look at God's prophecy to the serpent, he, God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. <laughs> so God says to the devil, there will be a savior that will crush you, and you will try to crush him, but he will crush you. So when the woman is counted according to her offspring, that is the ultimate offspring, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that is why Eve is called Eve, the mother of all the living, because she will produce Christ, or her line will produce Christ, and Christ will create all life, or sustain all life. And Pastor, create and recreate, sustain. And, and, didn't, and, and Eve, when her first child was born, who was Cain, she mm. thought that it was the man from the Lord, right? Yeah. And she did believe that promise. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we'll look back here at uh, chapter 2. So we saw 18, then God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a, him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper fit for him. So humanity having, or Adam being the, 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 figure of humanity representing all humanity. He has all of creation paraded before him, every creature paraded before him, and he recognizes that he is absolutely alone because all these creatures are not fit as a helper for him. He needs to be in community with a wife. And that's the nature of humanity is that, yes, you can fill a need for community with a whole bunch of animals, but none of these animals are what you need, which is another human being. So uh, also, this would point to the design of God's creation. So all these animals brought before God, 
they would have a specific purpose within creation. They would be created in uni in, in okay. connection with each other. So how many of each animal was created, we don't know, but there's at least enough for them to be fruitful and multiply. So God also, so sorry. So Adam also saw that all of these living creatures were in pairs and he's kind of going, wait a second. Why don't I have one? Uh, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that God, the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And, so, uh, uh, Pastor, mm -hmm. obviously God, when he, he brought a woman to Adam, must have explained what he did. Mm -hmm. In other words, because uh, he was in a sleep, so he couldn't couldn't know unless God told him. Right? Yeah. Well, part of this is, and that specific term for deep sleep, it's actually a very rare word in scripture. Um, basically, it also occurs when Abraham went into a deep sleep and then God cut a covenant with Abraham. So when God caught a covenant with Abraham when he was in that deep sleep, it was communicated that Abraham had absolutely no help in the cutting of this covenant. So Abraham was not responsible for any part of it. God put all the burden of the covenant on himself. So part of this is recognizing that it's not that man offered up one of his ribs, that he was uh, actively taking part in women's creation so that he would have dominion over the woman as God would have dominion over anything he created. Or even um, as, as human beings would have dominion over their children, because that's the basis of all government is, is the family. So man and women would look after the child. Uh, so the child naturally has to subdue themselves to the parents or be submissive to the parents. What I would say this is communicating is that women are not subordinate to their husband as a child would have to be subordinate to their parents. So the order of creation, man was created first, uh, woman was created second, that can continue. That's, that's referenced in the New Testament. But it's not as though uh, man, men in a relationship or husbands in a relationship can say, well, I have, I can create you, I have dominion over you, you have to follow everything I say, I'm the king of this household. No, it's, it's more of a cooperation type of thing where God was the one who created woman independent of man, although the flesh was of man's flesh. Simply put, they are different. There's an order. Because woman is the helper, the one who supplements everything man is not. But men are not intrinsically, historically, or, or by creation better, and I'm doing air quotes, and I don't, I don't think you can see, but I'm doing air quotes, better than women in the sense that men had some sort of hand in their creation. Um, so, I think God uh, did that to, to acknowledge the oneness of them. Yes. You know, that it yeah, um, created Adam and took Adam's, and out of Adam's body, he took mm -hmm. his rib to make them one and not to have a hierarchical system. Yeah. Well, there's a bit of a hierarchy with like created men created first women second so they're and that's what's referenced in the new testament is that um uh, men are the head of the household and women are submissive but what how does how does that work out well it has to work out and this is uh, ephesians chapter five that men being the head of the household have to be willing to give their own lives for their wives it is not that you get to lord it over your wife, I'm the head of this household, but no, you have to, as you are responsible for the household as God is responsible for his creation. 
So as God sent Jesus Christ into the creation to die for the creation and redeem everyone in it. So husbands should be uh, should be mindful that they have to give up their lives for their wives. So even though uh, uh, they're in a position of relative authority, that authority means that you bear a higher burden, not, not that you are de facto what I say goes. You have to first take into account what is best for your wife. And if that goes against what what you want to do, then it goes against what you want to do and you do what's best for your wife. We're at 25 after 10. Yes. So, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to try and wrap this up very quickly. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, very interesting. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to, so 2 verse 7, Genesis 2 verse 7, Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Since woman was taken from man, she is also from the dust of the earth and also has this exact same breath of life within her. So it's not that they are completely independent of one another, that they are uh, different. They are the same, but shaped for different purposes and given different roles. So they're the same, but different. <laughs> to put it very basically. Um, and this is also kind of reflected in Adam's comment. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So she is exactly the same as I am, but she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. But there's a historical uh, difference within the creation. And that's the difference. Uh, the, the word play also works out in, in Hebrew because the term for man is ish. The term for a woman is Isha. So she shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. So they're related, but uh, different. It was a very special creation when he created the animals, male and female. He just created them. Yeah. This was a very special creation when it created man and woman. Yeah. So to, to summarize very briefly what we were covering today, was the creation is made independently of human beings. Like even male and female, they were created independently of another, but from each other by God. So the creation event is all God, but we were created for specific purposes, namely to have dominion by shaping the world we're in and also to be procreators, uh, creating within the creation. And this is what we'll look at next week when we go, well, how does this work out in practice? Okay. So, uh, a, a brief prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord of all creation, for creating us and creating us within this perfection of your creation. We know, O oh Lord, that this creation has fallen due to mankind's sin, and we pray for your forgiveness for all the sins that we do, and we pray that through Jesus Christ, you restore us to the new creation in him. Uh, entering into the new heavens and the new earth, removed from the sinfulness of this world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> or you'll see Bye. me. Bye. Thanks. Pastor. <laughs>